It's time to shake and wake up the world with the best biblical talk shows from all over the world gathered in one place. Shakeandwakeradio.com, where the truth is all that matters, and the truth will set you free. Shakeandwakeradio.com. FOJC Radio, David and Donna Carrico, the dynamic duo of followers of Jesus Christ. Nah, we're just regular people. We're just loving and serving the Lord, and we challenge you to love and serve the Lord and learn all that you can about Him. We're preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. And thanks again for listening to our programs and blessings to all of you. I can hear you. Oh, no. 
Hey everybody, welcome to the show. We are very excited to have you here tonight, and as you can tell, I was not prepared to do this, but that's the way it goes sometimes. So I just want to say welcome, one and all. Uh, we got a very exciting show for you tonight. We're going to be looking at a couple, well, I know the title says the Jesuit uh, plot, the gunplatter plot, but we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at the North Berwick Witch Trials in Scotland. Um, and really dissecting uh, not only what went on, but why. What would the motivation be to take out this king who is these days so apparently corrupt and a Freemason and a homosexual? Why was there so much controversy around him, his Bible, what's going on? We want to dissect that, see if we can find out as much of the truth as possible, and hopefully come to the answer to see... Maybe uh, was this guy, what, was he any of these things? Or was he really somebody that God used to get the Bible into the hands of Christians so that way a, a, a reform and a removal from the Catholic Church could happen in God's time, give that, um, that providence that was needed to spread the gospel before the end times. So uh, thank you all for joining us tonight, and... Hope you look forward to the show. I uh, do just want to say, I'm going to go ahead and knock this out for Dan real quick. I uh, just want to say thank you to Annie over at Shake and Wake Radio, who carries both mine and Dan's show, and as well as BeforeIt'sNews.com, for which Dan is a contributing, uh, he's, a, he's a contributor over there. So uh, thanks and a big shout out to both of them uh, for, you know, giving us a platform to be able to carry this to even more people. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm so excited. I can't even get the words out tonight. So, uh, yeah. So Dan, how's everything going on your end? We looking good? I don't see that over there. One, two, so, one, two. Uh, yep, yeah, you we guys go. will one. give me just a second. I'm actually trying to get the chat pulled up right, All right now. All right, guys. So here we are. So um, I don't so know about your way, microphone. I can interact off with and... you guys as well. Cause right now I feel like I'm just talking to myself. Um, okay, which is you fine. Are. I honestly I do that all the time. It's you know it's yep. not talking to yourself that's bad. It's when you start to <laughs> answer you start yourself that yourself, uh, yeah. you might need some help. Um, but hopefully we're not going to be doing that anytime soon. So can you hear let's me now? See what we got going on over. Here. I can. I can hear you now. All right, so awesome. Hopefully so. I didn't screw screw that up too bad for no, you. No, that was pretty good. Thank you. And uh, so guys, I don't know what happened. I was playing with the microphone. <laughs> Uh, right before the show came on. So, yeah, so after the show, guys, we have the question and answers bonus show right out on the Rumble channel. So we'll take phone calls and all that good stuff. And, uh, yeah, welcome to the Jesuit Lies Propaganda and Assassination Attempt on King James Spiritual Warfare Friday. Me and Trey Harris here. And, um, again, uh, shakeawakeradio.com. Check them out and beforetsnews.com as well. So uh, tonight's show is brought to you by estherjades.com. And uh, right now the website's down. So go to the Facebook page. Yeah, that's the link for the Facebook page. And we'll actually show you the page here because I want to, um, before we get the show going, I do want to um, advertise this product real quick. This is their uh, lung cleanser. So as you all know, a uh, month ago, I come down with the flu, then pneumonia. I was out for the count literally for like a month. So this stuff here has actually helped me a lot. The lens cleanser because a uh, lens, <laughs> lung cleanser, okay. It's all, uh, you know, cleanses the lungs and everything else. Helped me out uh, to gain my lung capacity back and everything else from being sick with the flu and everything else. So, and also um, the awesome pain Buster cream, awesome stuff, yeah. It's a pain buster cream that, um, like, you put it on and, uh, like, two minutes later, yeah, you, you don't feel no pain no more, you know, from muscle aches and all kinds of stuff like that. And it's uh, 500 milligrams of CBD, you know, it's a lot, a lot of milligrams of CBD that's in the cream, and it's, like, a nice smell and everything else. So these two products, and I got many other products by her, but this lung cleanser stuff, if you got pneumonia or flu or anything like that, uh, you, you, you know, whatever else, you know, respiratory disease or sickness this stuff will help you out a lot so if you go to that page here that's a web right now they're running off that um facebook page it's esther jades ltd just look them up on facebook or you can go right to the slides there and take a snapshot with your camera there and again they're working on a website right now they're having like problems with the website so they will have the website up and running soon and uh yeah so yeah welcome to the broadcast and uh today we're gonna um dive into a lot of stuff today so <clears throat> 
As a, you know, a week ago, we had a show with me and Trey. We had talked about the Jesuits, the basic stuff about the Jesuits and the infiltration of society of <clears throat> through the education system, the religious system and everything else, even the political system, how the Jesuit order has really uh, turned everything upside and down and backwards again, you know what I mean? And also the massive lies, which well, Trey's going to um, take off of the show here, uh, take over the show, I should say, uh, about King James, uh, the massive lies and propaganda put against King James. Now, you hear it all the time, you see people think, oh, did you know King James was a mason? Did you know he was gay? Did you know he did this or that or whatever the case? And uh, so this is a lot of lies made up by the Jesuit church because of the significance of the King James Bible. I mean, there's a lot of history behind that stuff. And so we're going to get to all that stuff. We're going to answer a lot of questions about King James. Then we're going to go more into the Jesuits afterwards and just show you more stuff about the Jesuit order and stuff that I didn't even know. The last show I did, I thought I did a lot of research. No, not even close. We could do two, three more shows on the Jesuits. And I had no idea. I mean, I knew they had their hands deep in the mess, but man, wow. Uh, the order of the you know, Society of Je Jesus... They hide behind the name Jesus, but they're not at all nothing to do with Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, plain and simple. This is an anti-Christ religion, the strong arm of the Catholic Church. So, yeah. So, welcome everybody to the uh, show. And before we begin, let's do a quick prayer. So, Yeshua, Jesus, Messiah, we come before you. And please forgive us for our sins and trespasses. And Father, we ask you to protect us and against all evil that's put upon us, Lord, and against us, Lord, and pre please pray for, I'm sorry, please protect us all from the forces of evil and protect us broadcast and everything. And Lord, we ask you to give us the Holy Spirit, the great comfort, um, uh, to comfort our hearts, Lord, and give us the great information and uh, to great knowledge and everything that we need for the show today. In your mighty name we pray, amen. So yeah, sorry to talk so fast, guys. It's just been the whole day's been rush, 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 and you get in that mood, you just can't stop, you know, until you go to bed. So, all right. So uh, if you want to take it from there, I got your slides ready when you need them and whatever you want me to pull up. So, sure. um, yeah, I know Trey's been itching because the last uh, that show we did actually was two weeks ago on the Jesuits. Uh, Trey had a lot to say about King James, and uh, this is something I've been meaning to address too, because I keep seeing the videos. The people will say, "Oh, you know, King James is this or that, whatever the case," and we're gonna go through all that stuff and more and. Uh, uh, hopefully we can answer a lot of questions today and really get into the facts that, you know, the King James Bible is what it is. I mean, it is authentic. I mean, as it comes. So hopefully uh, at the end of the show, y'all yeah. could actually understand that. And if you've got any questions or doubts, you can call in and talk to us guys uh, after the you know, presentation. So uh, take, a, take it away, Trey. Yeah. And I'd just like to preface this by saying, all right, so let's just for the sake of argument, let's say that King James was a homosexual. Let's say that he was a Freemason. Let's say all of this, right? Um, you know, King James didn't really have anything to do with the King James Bible other than he was the one who authorized it to be made. You know, there were 47 translators that worked on it. King James was actually very hands-off. And this is a, this is actually information that you can find out from multiple sources. Um, so let's say even if that stuff was true, you know, take the King James, like, take it for what it is. You know, it's, it's a, it was a celebrity endorsed Bible, right? Um, but hopefully after tonight you will see, or at least have some sort of inkling that this wasn't the case. Number one, as far as the addressing with Freemasons, if, King James actually was a Freemason. Now, as the King of England, he was automatically somewhat tied to it, and the fact that he didn't shut it down, huge mistake. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, he screwed up there. There's just no getting around it. But if if he was a Freemason and he had a Freemason revival, then why do Freemasons like Manly P. Hall despise the King James Bible so much? Mm. And I've actually done shows on this. Uh, you can go to my YouTube channel and there's an entire show where we look at the Codex Sinaiticus, the fact that it there, that it's very well, a, like most likely a fraud. But one of the things we address in there, and you can find this at Chick Publications that make the Chick Bible tracks. They actually have articles on their website of all of this. I was going to try to pull some up and read from it, but my computer is being all wonky. So, um, but if, uh, guys like Manly P. Hall despised the King James Bible and actually said that within – you know, um, I can't remember the exact way he put it, but he was 
there were very clearly things he he said that alluded to the fact that you know the Codex Sinaiticus coming over and taking over and becoming a big part of the population would happen one day. And over here, right here, let me see if I can get to it. This, I don't know if you guys can see this, but that is an ESV study Bible, which very heavily relies on its New Testament for the Codex Alexandrinus, the Codex Vaticanus, and the Codex Sinaiticus. Um, and a lot of people don't even realize this, but you have the King James. Everybody, I think they just think that, oh, well, they just took newer versions of the Bible. Like, they just took the Bible and made newer versions of it in English, right? But that's not true. You have these two texts right here. Now, this one, this is the Textus Receptus. Now, if you look inside it, you know, you probably won't understand it. It'll probably be all Greek to you guys, and that's because, you know, it is. But over here, well, this is the Greek New Testament as well. But what's the difference? Well, this is based off of the 27th, I believe, the 27th edition of the uh, Nestle Olland text, which is who took over after Westcott and Hort, who, by the way, had Jesuit ties, if you didn't know that. Um, these, these are two completely different texts of the, of the New Testament. And if you go in a, a, a Bible like the ESV or the NIV or the NASB or the NLT or the NLV, or you take, pick your poison there, you're going to find 16 verses missing. Well, why is that? That's because these guys took 1% of all the biblical manuscripts that were on the earth. By the way, 99% of the biblical texts agree with each other. This is like, these would be your Byzantine texts, right? Then you have the other 1% that not only disagree with the Byzantine texts, but they disagree with each other. And these guys said, oh, well, they're older, so clearly they're the ones we need to go with. Because that's what you do. You always go with older. You don't go with the ones that agree more because that's common sense. Um, and so now you have 16 verses that are missing in modern Bibles, and you even have them make small omissions, like the fact that Jesus was the son of Joseph, as was supposed, and they take off the as was supposed and make Jesus, they just take away the entire doctrine of the virgin birth. Um, it's just, it's really sickening what they have done with the Bible. Um, so, but why would the Freemasons, especially people like Manly P. Hall, who was eulogized as Masonry's greatest philosopher, why would they hate the King James Bible so much if it was a Freemason Bible written by a Freemason? Yeah, and I want like, to point out, are, too, um, nobody Rick, like every leader in the world, guys, if I was to run for president tomorrow, right, and even though I'm against Freemasonry, I became president of the United States, I would automatically be granted a honorary Mason. Yeah, because what it does is why the Masons do that for? Uh, because they do this because they want that stature. Oh, this president was a Mason. That president was, even though half of them didn't even participate in Masonry, they could claim that because they made you an honorary Mason. Half the people don't even know what a Mason is. So you get a person who gets into office or a king or queen that granted honorary free Mason. To them, it's a little prestige because they hear a lot of stuff about Masonry. And to the Masons, oh, this is another claim to, uh, you know, it adds to our uh, stature. So that's why. And the thing is, half the Masons out there, they have no clue what Masonry is really about. We did tons of shows on Freemasonry because just because somebody's a Mason doesn't mean they're, you know, they work for the devil or, or something like that. You know what I mean? That's not the case. You know what I mean? There's a lot of Christians who are Masons and yeah. we're not condoning it. We're just saying that, that that's the case. You know, a lot of people don't know what Freemasonry is about. They get lied to. So that's why there's a lot of Christians of yeah. Freemasonry because they think it's something of God when it's nothing. Not, it's a, it's actually of Satan and they don't find that out to the hard way, yeah. you know? So uh, that, I just wanted to point yeah. that out. No, 100%. That's why books like this, shameless plug for FOJC, which, by the way, you guys can catch our episodes of Spiritual Warfare Friday uh, replayed on the uh, Underground Church channel now. Every um, but that's why this book, this book is so important. You know, guide, uh, the, the Guide for Ministry to Masons. Um, what you have to understand, and if you see this big hulk of a book right here, this is, they had the audacity to put Holy Bible with the square and compass. Um, but the way you have to understand it is, and if you ever hear, see anybody tell a video or see people make videos of the, uh, of the fact that the Mason Bible is just the Bible, notice that they'll always flip past like the first 50 pages. And it's because there's this tie, there's this article in here called the internal workings of Freemasonry. What you have to understand is there's something called the blue lodge Masonry. 
that's the first three degrees where people are basically kept in the dark. And from there, once you get to the fourth degree, uh, basically, and it depends, you know, are you Scottish right or York right Freemasonry? That's type of topic for a different day. But you'll slowly be progressively learning the more secrets of Freemasonry. You know, it's kind of what with Plato, he had an inner circle and an outer circle, right? And the reason he had that is because Plato was also an occultist. For people who don't know, Freemasonry's Freemasonry, one of their big philosophies that uh, Manly P. Hall talked about was something called Neoplatonism. And uh, that's, it follows this same thing. You have these three degrees where they learn something. And then in Morals and Dogma, I believe it is, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong here, but isn't it in, is it the 32nd degree in which Albert Pike basically says, yeah, all these things we've taught you before we were lying about, this is what we actually believe. Mm, I think um, it's 32nd, I know it's, but I know he, he was the one who created the 33rd degree, am I right? Yeah, 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 but, and you won't find the 33rd degree in, mm. in um, Morals and Dogma because officially, the official story is, is it's either a Supreme Council or an honorary title. Hmm. Uh, if you look inside the Freemason Bible, they'll tell you it's like a Supreme Council. But uh, yeah, somewhere in that book, he says that. He says that, you know, we've basically, you know, given them false meanings of what the symbolism is. And the no, reason they do Paul's that is... Books too. Uh, yeah. The keys yeah. of Freemasonry. He says it too. Lost keys. Yeah. He says the same thing. You intentionally sure. lied to, you know, until you, you, they feel that you're ready. Because the thing is, you start off as a block. This is symbolism. And they want to carve you into that perfect cornerstone. So yeah. you're lied to until they could carve you into that perfect cornerstone. That's why they take a good professing Christian and they delude them into the occult or they'll take an occult. If you ever notice, right, somebody who's into the occult rises through the ranks of masonry like no tomorrow because that's exactly where they want you to be, that mindset. And the Christians, they want to pull you into more esoteric knowledge and away from the Absolutely. Bible. So when you get into masonry, you, 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 it's nothing to do with the Bible at all. You know what I mean? And uh, we, we, we've done a lot of shows on that. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why they need this. That's why they need this Bible with their with their mark on it. Well, see, we believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about us. You you can be a Christian and be a Mason. We have a Bible on on our altar, um, and it's just. But that's the way that's the way it works in the occult. It's it's all about it's all smoke and mirrors. It's deception, and I believe, and I'm hoping now some of this stuff I'm going to talk about. Maybe it's not enough evidence for you guys. But it was sufficient for me. And I know, at least for me personally, some of the stuff that I have found, I actually had a hard time finding more firsthand accounts of it. Now, there were people, if you watch documentaries, they were like, yeah, we went into Westminster. We went into Westminster and we got the archives and we looked at the court documents. I couldn't find that stuff. Maybe it's out there. I just couldn't find it. Um, but it's really interesting because when you talk about this first thing with King James, it all pops up around the, the year 1589. And in 1589, basically what happens is, is King James, uh, is going to marry Anne of Denmark and he sends away, you know, he sends basically a procession to go pick her up. Uh, but they have trouble bringing her back because of some, you know, some bad storms on the way to Denmark. Well, eventually what happens from there is King James has to go. He goes and he gets her. Him, he goes to get her himself. And even his ships are like his personal ship is having a really hard time getting through these storms. But eventually he does get there. When he gets there, he finds out that there's actually a witch trial going on. This is the way the official story goes. There's a uh, there's an official witch trial going on. And basically the master of ships is um you know he's up in arms because he's been accused of making the the ship that end of denmark was supposed to depart on uh it wasn't strong enough to hold up against these uh these um uh these the, the you know the tempest of this storm and he's like look it's not me it's the storm itself and uh from there apparently you know there's these witches accused uh, the, the official story goes that they're tortured, uh, which, I mean, you can even read in the writings of King James. He admits that they tortured these people, um, you know, and uh, basically what happens is, is from there, you know, these witches say, yeah, you know, we were doing it, but we were actually in league with some witches from Scotland, too. And so 
King James gets Anne of Denmark and they sail back to Scotland. They go back to Edinburgh where the, uh, you know, the capital of Scotland is. And, you know, once again, they're hit with, they're hit with very bad storms. Well, after they get back, um, there's this, uh, this magistrate or this, this bailiff. And I actually had his name pulled up, but my, once again, computer is acting up. So if you guys don't mind, I'm going to, pull it up on my phone because I want to make sure that I've got the I want to make sure I'm giving this as accurately as I possibly can and I do apologize for the technical difficulties I'm having over here uh, it g- goes to show you when you talk about something like this <laughs> it's just <laughs> who there's, there's is it just me Dan or is there always a problem that happens oh it, it's universal man because I worked um, radio stations I worked at even info wars and all that and every day is something like when we start the show tonight at everything everything's online and everything else and all of a sudden start off the show and I, I guess I muted my mic by accident with the tray and knocked my mic off the system here so I'm like yeah. talking and there's no sound I'm like oh crap so uh, yeah, it's always something, and that's uh, the way it is in the business. You could be at the the top notch radio stations. I noticed that even with the news, uh, like the other night I was watching the news, and this is billion dollar stu- you know, studios. You know what I mean? And they have problems. Yeah. So, so there's always a problem with this stuff. And you, and some of these places got well, they're their own producers. So me and Trey is a one man show. Well, he's operating the switches over there. I'm operating the switches over here and trying to talk at the same time, keep an eye with the chat. So you got to be multitasked to do this. Uh, you yeah. really do, and uh, so. Uh, so there's always going to be hiccups, even with a lot of people. There's always hiccups too. So, sure. Well, and that's the joy. That's the joy and the fun and mm. the suspense of doing live broadcasts, right? Yep. Uh, you, you know, you got to kind of roll with the punches and go from there. Um, let me see. I'm going to try something real, real quick. And this, oh, no problem. This is either going to go really yeah. good or really bad. So we're going to find out. <laughs> I'm going to try to pull up yet another window. Do what? Are you uh, like glitching for a minute? Because you're oh yeah. Off. Well, that's because I. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just that's yeah that you know. One more thing to add to the list, right? So yep. so, but here we go. So I was actually it was the treasurer. His name was Christopher Valkendorf. You know, and he uh, basically, um, according to the the official report, is the storms were blamed on the wife of an official that was in Copenhagen, Copenhagen that had insulted him. Now, from here, basically what's happening is, you know, the official narrative says that at this point, King James started getting really paranoid about witches. And, you know, this man was, he was terrified of witches. And, you know, even if he was paranoid, that you know, think about it. It's justified. You know, he, you know, he, so his mother, Mary Queen of Scots, saw one of her handmaids murdered in front of her. Well, then she fled with James and went somewhere else. And eventually Mary Queen of Scots is arrested and beheaded by elizabeth right so imagine you're this kid you're growing up like you know you're really small because king james was separated from his mother at four years old which is one of the things we can get into to refute the claims of him being a cross-dresser with his mother and things like that he was separated from his mother at a very early age but you know trauma like this really affects you as a child like you have these irrational fears and you don't know where they come from right You know, I know kids who get bit by dogs when they're really young and they're terrified of dogs. They have this just just this this petrifying fear of dogs for the rest of their life. Right. So, you know, your mom is, you know, taken like this is this is your mom. Right. This is the person who's taking care of you. It's taken from an early age. You don't get to see her. And then as a grown man, you see her killed in front of you, um, you know, publicly, you know, executed. I would imagine that would that would mess with your mind a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I have no I have no problem saying that. Yeah, maybe he was a little paranoid. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. That's I mean, that could be a fact. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't change the the fact that for me, my job is is there evidence? Is there a reason that would suggest that Satan and the kingdom of darkness would want to take King James out. Is there a reason that he would use witches 
Jesuits, any of this, what reason would there be? Can we find a reason that would be even plausible to say that, hey, maybe the witches did try to assassinate him? Maybe the Jesuits did try to do this, you know? Uh, that that's what I'm interested in. I, I, the rest of it doesn't bother me, you know? Um, you know, the fact that people were tortured and they could have been innocent, I think that should bother anybody. I think even if they're guilty, the fact that they're tortured, I don't, I'm not okay with that personally. Um, I just don't think you should torture people. I think it's cruel. I think it's, uh, not very, a very reliable way to get evidence because you torture anybody long enough, they'll confess to anything just to stop the pain. I think they've psychologically proven that. Um, but anyway, from there, what happens is, is you go into, um, you get into the, the, the Scottish part of it, which basically what happens is, is you have a ton of women and everybody loves to focus on the women, especially in today's age, because, you know, you got to prove that that patriarchy was like sexist and evil and things like that. But there were men accused too. Uh, you know, there was Robert uh, Grierson, and I believe the big famous one was um, John Cunningham, a.k.a. Dr. Fian. Um, but basically what happens is, is when he gets back, um, you know, he's got this, this thought allegedly in the back of his head that, you know, oh, well, these witches, they've teamed up with people in in scotland you know i need to get to the bottom of this and there's this this bailiff who had a he had a girl that uh was like a, a she worked in his house her name was uh gilly duncan and gilly duncan apparently uh she supposedly had these she manifested these magical powers and she would disappear at night and the bailiff was like look you know i think this girl might be one of the witches that uh, you know, attacked your ship. And so they round up this girl and she, after being uh, tortured, uh, conf like basically says, yes, it was there, but it wasn't just me. There were these other women and there was a woman by the name of Agnes Sampson, Barbara Napier, um, and, and like hundreds of other women. But Agnes Sampson's the interesting one, because from here, Agnes Sampson was known as the wife, wise, wife, wise wife of Keith, and she was a healer. Um, they take her in, and they do their their interrogations on her, and she does. She confesses to it. She was like, "Look, I was approached by the I was approached by the devil himself, and the devil told me that this king was going to be an enemy to him and his kingdom, and we needed to take him out." So what we did from there was the devil manifested these body parts from people that were buried beneath the church that they were meeting in, and they took these uh, bones and they used them in their rituals. Well, then what happens is Agnes Sampson supposedly takes a boat out into the sea with a party, body part of a corpse tied to a cat that was uh, you know, basically blessed or cursed rather by Satan and threw it into the sea to create the storm. King James goes through and details in his letter, his pamphlet, News from Scotland, that uh, after hearing her confession, after hearing the confession of Dr. Fian, who only ever after torture confessed to a, uh, making a love potion that backfired and got put on a cow and being followed around by a lovesick cow. And King James was like, look, these people are obviously liars. <laughs> Like, that's what he said. It's documented that he said this. He was like, these people are lying. And he was ready to be done with it. And then the way the official story goes, according to news from Scotland, is that King James is approached by Agnes Sampson. It was like, look, you don't believe me? I'll make you believe. And then she proceeds to tell him the words that Anne of Denmark told him when they were in their layover in Norway. And King James says... There's no way that all of the devils in hell beneath could have known that she said that. And apparently that is allegedly when he changes his mind. Well, look what they and, did to uh, King Louis the 16th. They, him and uh, yeah. his queen Antoinette. You know, they, yep. um, they call, you know, the Illuminati Druids and Jacobins, they caused the food shortage to start the uh, French sure. Revolution. And they blamed sure. the king and the uh, queen and said, uh, you know, they brought up a quote 
she said something out of context years before that when she was a kid about let them eat cake. And so they brought it up as yeah. she just said this because it was a food shortage, which pissed off all the people yeah. in France that caused this revolution. So, I mean, you could see the... It, it, the same people involved too, by the way. You know what I mean? The same exact people involved uh, causing these lies and propaganda right. against the leader. You know what I mean? And uh, you, you see that going on in real life today. When somebody looks like a good leader, they'll cause lies and propaganda against them. You know, it's a it's sickening. Sure. Well, you remember what they said about Matt Gates? Yeah. And I think he actually proved that their allegations were untrue. I mean, look, I, I wouldn't be surprised either way here in America. You know, we're just our nation is run by degenerates. But it is a proven fact that even in today's society, if they don't like somebody, they attack their their morality, right? They attack their character, mm -hmm. their beliefs, things like that. Now, here's what's interesting. Because the official story goes that after they do these things, well, then they confess and they say, hey, look, there's no way we could have done this by ourselves. We were actually approached by somebody from the Stewart family. That's what I find interesting. Now, apparently, there's all sorts of professors who say, well, you know, this guy doesn't fit the timeline or this and that. But who would have known better that King James would have gone away from the Stuart tradition than a Stuart, right? I, I would be inclined to believe that. I think that's plausible, at least, hmm. that a Stuart would approach because, I mean, we're talking some serious, you know, how much of a crime it is to like how much of like, like you don't, you don't turn your back on these people, and I, I find that fascinating. Um, now the official story goes. For fairness' sake, I do want to just say that uh, you know the way that the way that the secularists believe this is well, uh, they were probably coerced into saying that. Um, but I'm telling you, after reading books like uh, Bloodline of the Holy Grail and Genesis of the Grail Kings and Realm of the Ring Lords, uh, just even reading the few little bits of these books that I'm already into, because I haven't finished any of them. But the parts that I've seen, I think that's totally plausible. My opinion. That is my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. But I find that fascinating. Now, here's where I really think it gets interesting. What would... What does the kingdom of darkness have to gain from taking out somebody like King James? And I think this is where it gets interesting. I probably should have included this in my slides. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you guys. I had a whole set of slides ready. And due to the app I was using, it would not let me move them from the app without paying uh, Facebook money. And I just I refused to do that. So at the last minute, I had to make a new set of slides that covered, you know, just some interesting facts that we're going to talk about. So, uh, yep, you know, I'm sorry for that, but I'm not giving I'm not giving uh, Zuckerberg my money. Yeah, I'm just not doing it. Um, but what's interesting is is you can back this story up and go to what is going on. What is the broader context of what is going on? in the 1500s at this point and that is the bible is finally getting into the hands of the laity in a language that they can read and understand it all starts with a man and it, we're talking like look i understand about the gutenberg bible and things like this but i'm talking about bibles that are based off of the textus receptus the received text and the first one to do that was a man by the name of William Tyndale. Now, William Tyndale was known for openly defying the Pope. You know, he said he wanted to be able to get that Bible into the man of the common or get into the hands of the common man. Um, well, eventually, the way the story goes is one day he's tricked into coming out of his house and they arrest him. Well, he's sentenced to death for treason and heresy and burned at the stake. And his famous last words are, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Now, at this time, the king of England was Henry VIII, who openly opposed the ideals of William Tyndale. But if you know the Tudor history... After Henry VIII comes Elizabeth I, the alleged virgin queen who never had an heir. Well, her heir apparent was King James VI of Scotland. 
Now, I look at this, and I think, I'm Satan. I'm the minions of Satan. I'm paying attention to this prayer because I know what the power of prayer does. I'm familiar with the history of the church because I've been around for thousands of years, and especially that, that, that request of a man who is dying for his faith, right? Who is doing exactly what the Bible says, you know, the love. There's no greater love than to lay down your life for another. Well, he laid down his life to get the word of God into the hands of people, right? I mean, what what an amazing what an amazing way to go to go, right? Mm. Um, you know, so I'm looking at this and I see the way it's going. You know, by the time Elizabeth gets here, she doesn't have an heir. She's getting older. She dies. I'm going after that guy. Whether I like, you know, I'm not going to take the chance that he could be the king of England whose eyes are open, right? I'm going after him. And and it's so it's so fascinating because I look at it as the same kind of blunder that happened back in 2020, right? Things escalate too fast, and it actually does more for the kingdom of God than it doesn't. And you could say, well, what did 2020 do for the kingdom of God? Well, number one, it opened people's eyes to how corrupt the government actually is, right? I think that's something that could – there only good things can come from that. It's a matter of whether we capitalize on it or not. Um, but you look at this, and let's say that for argument's sake that somebody, whether it was these people who were executed for it or not, I don't know. But I do believe that somebody – went after King James. You know, I'm going after him, and what does he do after this? He writes the one of the greatest, uh, in, in my opinion, one of the greatest dial, like dialogues about exposing witchcraft that's ever been made. The only other one that I think could compare is The Damned Art of Witchcraft by William Perkins. But you have demonology that is written that literally is, if you haven't read it, you need to. It's not the most entertaining read. It's written in the form of a Socratic dialogue. So it's two fictional characters talking philosophy and reason and, in this case, biblical exposition to each other. And one is teaching the other what the Bible is saying about witchcraft. You know, what, it compares necromancy. It's very, a very technical book, but it's, it's enlightening. So that comes from that. King James writes this book that exposes witchcraft. And, and then I after this, point out what real does he quick do? too with this yeah, book. Sure. So the ones both me and Trey got. Um, so there's a lot of authors that take the writings and make their own book with it. So you gotta be careful. Like this guy Donald Tyson. This is one I have. This guy Donald, mm -hmm. Donald Tyson. He's actually uh, a new ager. He's a witch, the practicing witch and all that. So what they'll do is at the beginning, and you know when they, you know, they'll you know, the authors will talk about their own story, encouraging witches and new ages to read this book, which I think is cool because it might lead them to the Bible, which is great. Sure. But, um, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, you got to be careful, guys, like uh, the authors themselves. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll put the original book in there, yes, but the first few pages or so, it's um, these authors are witches and stuff. You know what I mean? Some of them are, some ain't, whatever the case, but uh, just to be aware. So if you actually get this and you're like, but this is about witches and all that so don't don't let that delude you, you know what i mean just say don't even read that their part just read the part actually from king james i mean if you get, actually get a book with just king james stuff in it it's even better but it's hard to find a good copy uh that just has the demonology in it without the con you know comments and all that from these uh witches and new ages yeah yeah well and i will say the one i got was from a library like or from a publisher that that publishes hmm. um like um they publish oh crap what did i do <laughs> um you know they publish occultic books but they've from what i can tell they've left this fairly untouched um i wish that i had my copy in front of me so i could tell you what it was but uh i'll have to make sure to find that and do a follow-up video on my channel for it because it is like and like the thing is, is people actually from the occultic side of things, they rag on the writing style that King James chooses to use because he does it in the form of a Socratic dialogue, which if you're not familiar is basically it's the same format that Plato wrote, uh, you know, his Republic in, um, you know, Plato wrote the Republic writing from the perspective of Socrates, his mentor. 
And it's Socrates talking to a few other guys, um, hence the Socratic dialogue. Um, but King James wasn't the only guy who did that. I've got a book. Uh, there's a book. Um, the one I've got is an updated version called Journey to Hell, but it's basically um, it's a updated title of a book by John Bunyan. That was like the life of Mr. Badman, I believe is what it, the life and death of Mr. Badman. And it is also written in the form of a dialogue. It's two men discussing the death of this guy named Mr. Badman who dies and he goes to hell. It's like literally the, the, the you know, the Pilgrim's Progress is about a guy on his way to the kingdom of God, right? On the way to heaven. You know, it's a, and, 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 uh, what's the word? An allegory of a, the Christian walk. Well, this is a dialogue discussing, you know, people who have the opposite fate but it's not like this was an uncommon way to write a book it's just it takes a little getting used to to read it you know that's it hmm. yeah exactly it's like you know king james bible it's just like read it slowly and you'll get it it's not not too absolutely. hard absolutely no yeah, so like, um, you know, basically what we're trying to do is just um, tell the truth about King James other than get these conspiracy theory videos out there. Although here's something like, you know, again, King James being a Freemason and all that. So they'll run wild with it without doing the research, without actually investigating it. They'll run wild and say, you know, we should just completely dismiss the King James Bible when you know, even though uh, King James didn't even write one word in that Bible. I uh, used 47 uh, scribes to do this. Uh, we had over 50 at one point, but they, it's right here. Um, so on June 30th, uh, 1604, James had approved a list of 54 revisers, although the extent records show there was only 47. So participated in writing the King James Bible. It, this took years, guys. This didn't take, um, you know, a couple months or whatever the case, the case. This took years to write. Many, many years. And I'll show you on Absolutely. the internet. Yeah. Many years for this um, Bible to be written. And these people were um, from Westminster, Oxford, and Cambridge of sections of the Bible. And he had six divisions, too. So they, they, I guess they split these people into six divisions. And uh, these 47 men into six different divisions. And what they would do is they'll, they'll work on something. Then they'll switch it over to the other groups for them to prove that. It was a long process. That's why it wasn't just put together. Let's just write something up and throw it out there. No. This Bible took many years, many scholars and all that stuff to actually, uh, and again, the, the teams had to agree with the other team's work before it got approved. Then, of course, uh, King James like authorized the whole thing. But King James himself didn't write anything in here. You know what I mean? So because you get the theory, oh, King James Bible is a Masonic Bible. It's not a Masonic Bible. Masons had nothing to do with the Bible. These men here were handpicked by King James, and every one of them were true believers. Every single one of these uh, scholars were real believers. You know, Protestant believers. Yeah, and they were they were fluent in multiple languages that are now dead, and mm -hmm. were even I believe most of them were dead in that day or dying. Um, you know, that's that's an insane amount of, you know, accolades and scholarship. I mean, and it's just, I don't know. I mean, look, I'll tell you, this Masonic Bible I've got down here, and really every Masonic Bible I've ever laid my eyes on, yeah, they're all King James. Number one, because, you know, King James is a public domain. It's, you know, copyright free. It's, you know, it's mm -hmm. easy to reproduce. Um but and I'm I'm going to find it. I'm looking for it right now. I'm going to find this article that yeah. was about Manly P. Hall because Manly P. Hall hated the King James Bible, despised it. Yep. Um, and if you know people like that, and why would you it, despise you know it? <laughs> yeah, why would you despise it if it was a Masonic Bible? Yeah. Well, that's just that's just silly. Yeah, and the King James took seven years, seven whole years to. Uh, go back and forth to actually approve all the, every little text of it, and yeah, it was published in 1611. They started June 30th, 1604. So it took all these years, 47 of the best scholars in Europe, uh, to come up with a per perfect Bible uh, in 1611. So this was a long, lengthy process, long, lengthy process. And so um, there's a lot of work that went into this too. And uh, the other thing too, you got um, you could like King James. We're not here to cheerlead for King James, you know what I mean. But here's sure. the fact, right? You can say what you want to care about King James, but this very Bible here, this very Bible saved the lives of countless people. 
know how many people mm-hmm. get massacred and murdered? You had the Tinsdale Bible, you had the Geneva Bible, the Wycliffe Bible, and all that. These guys would be hunted down by the Catholic Church, the Jesuits, the Knights Temple, whole nine yards, hunting these people down to kill them. You know what I mean? And uh, so when this came out, and this was massively produced all over the like the free world at the time, it completely derailed the Catholic Church's authority. It really did. So they had no choice to drop these edicts that outlawed the Bible. You know what I mean? So there's a great documentary I got on my channel here. It's called A Lamp in the Dock, The Untold Truth. I'm sorry, The Untold History of the Bible. And it shows all that and more. And I'm telling you, man, uh, this here saved the lives of so many, so many people, Protestants and Christians alike, because from the Catholic Church's hands. Yeah, I mean, you get these people out there that bash the Bible, or like these naysayers, whatever. They say, well, if... You Christians are so good. Why'd you kill so many people during the Dark Ages and Inquisition? No, no, no. It wasn't Christians and you know, uh, at all killing uh, people. It was the Catholic Church killing Christians and Protestants, like for possessing the Bible. They killed over about a million families, literally a million families, for kids and all babies. They would smash the baby's skulls on the ground and everything else. Disgusting. Then they would bury these people, uh, unbury them, and put curses on them. And these people were vile, disgusting, what they were doing, the, the Jesuits and all that. We're going to get to that later. But so many people died to bring you this Bible. And this saved so many lives afterwards. So you could say whatever you want about King James. That's your prerogative. You could not like the man, but you do need to respect the fact that that Bible, that King James Bible, the 1611 Bible, has saved the lives of so many people. And it depowered the overthrow. I'm sorry, he depowered uh, the the vile catholic church we've done a lot of shows on all this stuff man and uh here i tell you this is just so much you know we can't give you enough information to uh really expose all these people because there's so much information so much depth that we could spend hours and days and years on here and not even cover because this is how evil this is how like you look into the pit of evil this is how evil it is. And when, when Trey brings up these guys like uh, Albert Pike and all these people, their quotes and all that, you're going to see really how evil these people are. Uh, did you find that yet? Or you? I am digging through the articles right now. Oh, yeah. Now, a lot of these are really good because, you know, it's on, like, there's an article up here. Like, guys, you need to go check out the articles on Chick Publications. One of these is the 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 chair of the translation for the New American Standard Bible yep. says that he's in trouble with the Lord and you need to stop reading that Bible and read the authorized version, which is the King James. I mean, I don't know how much better it can get than a guy who made a Bible that literally, if you read the uh, if you read the introduction to the New American Standard Bible, it says that hey, we love the King James. We just want to make a version of the King James that uses more accurate manuscripts. So it's literally a King James counterfeit. And this mm. guy's saying, no, just read the authorized version. Like, yeah. you know, this is this is interesting stuff. Like, I love, I don't agree with everything that the guys over at Chick Publications say, but one thing I do love is they speak out against the Jesuits, they speak out against Freemasonry, and they speak out against false translations of the Bible. You know, as far as I'm concerned, that makes us on the same team. Yeah, absolutely. And that's uh, what you got to look at, too, because... Uh, <laughs> You know, all these, uh, of course, got to put rumors out about certain kings and leaders and all that. And they do this for, uh, to, you know, but the evil, the establishment do this all the time against good people who are uh, leaders of some sort. You know what I mean? And so, and again, we know, we're not saying King James is perfect. No, nobody is. I'm not perfect. Trey's not perfect. We sin every day. You know what I mean? And uh, it, same with them. You know what I mean? So we're not saying they're perfect, but, you know, God uses people. Uh, and he uses evil people to look at Paul, for example, when he was uh, Saul. Perfect example. He used to go killing uh, followers of Jesus Christ, his apostles, and all the yeah. you know, people followed him. And they became one of the strongest advocates for Jesus afterwards. So put that together, you know what I mean? And uh, look at, you know, use uh, leaders that like to do his will, you know what I mean? And uh, it mm-hmm. just goes on. I mean, we could be here all day with this stuff, but yeah, like Brian just yeah. said, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> No, and you can't. So I found the article. Um, I don't know why I just didn't type it into Google because <laughs> that nine times out of ten still does work for most things. Uh, but it's called King James Bible, a major obstacle to the New World Order. And I'm just going to read you this. This is by David W. Daniels, who is, uh, you know, if you go to Chick Publications' YouTube channel, that's who you're going to see. Like, this guy is just, he's an excellent presenter. Uh, you know, he just, I mean, this guy knows his stuff. You know, a Google search for New World Order turns up thousands of references. 
People love to talk about the New World Order, the NWO. What do they mean? In the simplest form, it's, it is two things. Number one, a world without God. Number two, a world without reminders of God. Prominent occultist Manly Palmer Hall was deeply into the New World Order. He wrote about the NWO and showed what the King James Bible has to do with it. Hall wrote about many religions. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a 33rd degree Mason, loved Hall's occultic NWO teachings. 47 years after Hall wrote about Masonry, he was given an honorary 33rd degree. The man had major connections and lots of money. During World War II, over a year before the USA bombed Japan, Manly P. Hall considered how to make one world government. Quote, in the next 10 years, we will have to rebuild a world civilization. I hope for some, for some psychologists and even philosophers to be among those appointed to administer this problem. What he is alluding there to there is Francis Bacon's uh, New Atlantis, by the way. Uh, we will sit at a council table and figure out how to iron out the troubles on the earth. No post-war program can be successful unless at least uh, unless at least three and probably five generations of social conditioning, which, by the way, is the same thing as social engineering, goes with it. Hall foresaw five generations of conditioning starting in first grade, uh, starting in first grade, needed to, quote, create a world capable of mental and emotional tolerance, end quote. Now look at what Hall claimed. Uh, now look at what Hall claimed is erroneous thinking. "Quote: To make things right, we will have to undo much that is cherished error. The problem of revising the Bible shows how difficult it is to do this. For the last hundred years, which, by the way, was this was the 1940s. For the last hundred years, um, I lost my place. Dag on it." Uh, for the last hundred years, we have been trying to get out an edition of the Bible that is reasonably correct, but nobody wants it. What's wanted is the good old King James Version, every jot and tittle of it, because most people are convinced that God dictated the Bible to King James in English. Which, I mean, he didn't, but King James was used providentially to bring the best minds you know, and, you know, God had his hand on all of this. You, mm -hmm. you will never convince me otherwise. So never mind that he lied about King James Bible believers. Catch what he said. Who is we? Hall is an occultist. Who was involved? Who was he involved with? And what did they do to the Bible from the 1840s to the 1940s? The only Bible supposedly found in the 1840s was Codex Sinaiticus. Why is an occultist who disbelieves the Bible concerned with fixing it? If he got rid of the King James Bible, what would go in its place? Psychology can be the basic science of human tolerance. That's a quote. That's a Psychology, good question right there. Uh, really yeah. Good question. What, uh, this guy is, you know, anybody, I mean, he admitted it. I mean, it's not expressly. If you read uh, 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 Manly P. Hall's books there, and he admitted it was a cultist, you know what I mean? And uh, Luciferian and everything else says, so why would he be concerned about the Bible? You know what I mean? That's a big question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and more importantly, you know, and it's interesting because the Codex Sinaiticus is one, it was allegedly found in the 1840s in a monastery uh, out in the Sinai Peninsula. Now, here's what's interesting about that. The guy who found it, um, Constantine Tischendorf, Found it in a trash can. That's his claim. He allegedly found it in a trash can and was like, yeah, no, we should keep this. So let's say it even, let's say it was a real Bible, which if you go look at the actual Codex Sinaiticus itself, it's it's pretty sus, as the kids say. Uh, you know, it's, so number one, the manuscripts, the two sections of the manuscripts are kept on complete opposite sides of Europe. And one is very stained and aged looking and one is spotless white. What's up with that? That's weird. Hmm. Like, why would these Bibles have two different colors if they were found in the same place? That's odd. Yeah. But it's even weirder when you realize that the Pope commissioned Tischendorf to go down here for whatever reason it was that he went down here. And if you want to know more information about this, once again, 
uh, Chick Publications has, they've actually done a lot of research on this because like one of their big things is like they want to, they're, they're big about defending the King James. Now these guys are King James only. That's one of the places I vehemently disagree. Like they don't, I don't, as far as I'm aware, uh, they don't think that it does any good. Like the King James is perfect, so you don't have to look at the Hebrew. You don't have to look at the Greek. And while I agree that the King James is perfect and you could get by without looking at those things, you're only going to be edified if you dig even deeper. And God rewards those people who dig deeper. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the mm. honor of kings to search it out. Um, you know, this is this is interesting stuff to me. Why? Does Manly P. Hall care so much about changing the Bible, especially if it's a Freemason Bible? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. No. If I'm a Freemason and I'm eulogized as Freemasonry's greatest philosopher, and the King James actually is a Freemasonry Bible, I'm going to be like, nope, no need to change it. <laughs> really pulled one over on them. But that's not what he does. Yeah. And he has he whole says the for complete New opposite. Order. And like uh, the next paragraph, I don't know if you want to read that. Yeah. Yeah. So he says, you know, he says, Hall is right. For a new world order, you need to condition, you need people conditioned from childhood like the Nazis conditioned German kids. He actually wrote that too. Uh, and for tolerance, you need people who will go with the flow, which if that doesn't describe modern Christianity, I don't know what does. Yeah. It says, but Christians are like big, bright buoys in the water who Hall would say were anchored to the jot and tittle of the King James Bible. So Hall hoped to free you from the solid anchor of the King James so you'd flow with his new world order. In his student's monthly letter, uh, fourth year, number 12, Hall elaborated, quote, examine several editions of the Christian Bible, the polyglots, and get a parallel Greek-English text. We will discover numerous errors and alternative renderings. Read the Vulgate, the Septuagint. You will see the uselessness of picking phrases to pieces and trying to think in terms of jots and tittles. Now, what's interesting is, is because depending on what polyglot you're getting, a lot of those, uh, especially like a lot of the Greek polyglots come from the Alexandrian texts, which don't agree with the Textus Receptus. Now, I have no problem. As you can see, I own... I own the, you know, I own the, the critical text, uh, you know, and I think it's, I, I have found great edification in it just doing comparisons for enter for, for instance, Dan, second Thessalonians chapter two, where it talks about the man of sin. Mm -hmm. If you ever notice in modern translations, it doesn't call him the man of sin. It calls him the man of lawlessness. That's because in the Greek, they're different words in the Greek and the Texas Receptus, the word is hamartia which is the Greek word for sin. But in the critical text, it's uh, anomia, which is, you know, lawless. So it literally means without law. Uh, so they've changed it. Now, the word anomia does pop up in the Texas Receptus when verse 9, when it says that wicked shall be revealed. But you change that word, and now we're like, well, that's no big deal. You know, if you're, if you're, you're a man of sin, you are lawless, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, but you can be a man of lawlessness and not be a man of sin. I think that that word sin there was used for an intentional reason because it actually shows the origins of this guy's genealogy, if that makes sense. This guy's called the son of perdition. There's only one other person called the son of perdition in the Bible, and that's Judas Iscariot. And there's a really old teaching on FOJC, and I mean you're talking like back when you know FOJC first started years ago. Uh, that discusses the fact of Judas Iscariot and this Antichrist, this man of sin, both being a actual son of Satan. And I believe that's why the term son of sin is, or the man of sin is used. Because he is literally, just as Jesus is, you know, God incarnate and his perfection manifest, I believe this guy is sin manifest as a son of Satan. And if you change that, it, it to me, just like you do if you say you take out the as was supposed in Luke chapter 3, it changes the, the, the creedal statement there. This guy's no longer, he's just any other lawless man.
which by the way, all a lawless man is, is anybody who tells you that the Ten Commandments are no longer valid and the law has been done away with, that's a man of lawlessness. Mm -hmm. We're talking something beyond that here. And, you know, these Greek texts, these are the things like, you know, jots and tittles have literally been changed. Just because something is older does not make it better. It's about the care and who crafted it. Mm -hmm. You know, you could drink, you know, I know that, you know, a lot of people may have, um, they may have, you know, I, I don't mean to offend anybody here is basically what I'm saying. I know people, you know, everybody has different views on anything with alcohol or things like that. But in the Bible, you know, we'll use we'll use a, 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 a substance that's talked about in the Bible and both in a positive and a negative light. Um, and that's wine. You can have an aged wine. If it was made by a crappy winery, it's still not going to taste good. And you can have a newer wine. You know, that was from a recipe that was handed down generation to generation that was perfectly kept and crafted in that same manner. And it can be wonderful, right? You could do that with a lot of things. You could do that with bread. You could do it with anything. You know, it's only as good as the people who preserved it, right? And I would like to pose to you all that the Textus Receptus, though technically the manuscripts are newer, have been preserved better because the manuscripts that they were based off of have a more prolific agreement. And even those manuscripts were in circulation even greater than the Iliad by Homer, if that tells you anything. Like there's tons of evidence that suggests that even though these manuscripts are, you know, we don't have the oldest of the old for these, they're more well preserved because they agree with each other. Whereas this 1% don't even agree. They not only disagree with those, but they disagree with themselves. Alexandrinus, Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus all disagree with each other. There's variables in them all. Why is that? Because they were not preserved. Now, number one, Alexandrinus, where did this text come from? Alexandrinus, as its name would suggest, was found in Alexandria. Well, if you're not familiar, Alexandria was the center that Gnosticism came out of. So should I really trust a manuscript that comes from the hub of Gnosticism just because it's older? Especially when books like John, you know, the epistle, you know, the, the epistle of first John, especially, and the gospel of John, both are actually, and, and here's the, here's the scholarly theory on that. The scholarly theory is that the, the, uh, the book the epistle of first John was actually written as a cover letter for the gospel because both talk about and prove the physical incarnation of Jesus Christ, which went against one of the Gnostic beliefs of that time because a perfect soul could not inherit a corruptible body. That was the view of Gnosticism. That was the, one of the separations. Um, but, and isn't it interesting that one of the verses in a lot of these newer Bibles, you know, there are three that testify, you know, uh, that verse has been shortened. And in some cases, flat out removed from these newer manuscripts. Why is that? Because it is a witness to the triune Godhead, which goes against Gnostic belief. And I'm sorry, but you should not accept a manuscript that is from a Gnostic sub just because it's older. That's ridiculous. Mm. You know, anytime you're looking at evidence, the more witnesses there are, the more credible the source is. But for some reason with the Bible, we have done the complete opposite, which is so stupid. It, it just, it baffles me. Yeah. And we did our shows before too, um, you know, exposing false translations of the Bible, especially the NIV and all that stuff. But I mean, mm -hmm. and it shows you like, why divert, why couldn't you just keep, keep the King James Bible and that's it? You know, why would it, we, oh, because it's easier to read. It's not easier to read. Um, so you got, you mean to tell me because we're, we're taking out thousands of words, entire verse is going missing, changing important keywords or removing them. That's more easier than reading the King James. Yeah, the King James, yeah, yeah could be a little difficult. But if you take your time and examine it, it's like not difficult at all. You know, not the only this, but, thou, you know, that, you know, how yeah. they speak back then. Well, look, here's the big thing about, here's the thing, big thing about uh, ye are like ye and you versus thee and thou. 
the and thou, if you see that, that is somebody talking to a singular person. Yep. But if you see ye or you, that is a group of people. One is singular, one is plural. If you can understand that, that'll make the King James a lot easier to mm. understand. And that's actually what it took for me. I had a hard time with the these and thous, but I would argue that the NIV makes it harder because everything is automatically replaced with you. So now you don't know if they're talking to singular or plural. The and thou versus ye and you actually makes it easier because now if you understand that, you know, okay, talking to a singular person. I'm a visual person. I visualize things when I read them. Um, and so for me, that helps a lot because now I can picture somebody talking to a group of people. That makes it a lot easier to understand or if it's a more intimate conversation. And I think stuff like that is important. I don't think it's there by accident. Um, but, you know, it, it goes farther than this because there is a verse in the Bible that says, study to show thyself approved. So why would I want to read an easier Bible? This is me personally, because like, for instance, you know, we're very open about this on my channel. Second Timothy. Me and my wife. Yeah. I and mean, me and my wife are both advocates of the King James. My wife, despite her best efforts, still has a hard time with the King James. So what she does is she reads the New King James, which she'll tell you is not a great translation, and compares it to the King James to help her understand the King James better. But she will tell you herself, if you can, read the King James. I don't fault her for that because I understand that everybody's on different levels and we're never going to get it perfectly right. But she's trying her best, right? Because that was actually something we've gotten flack for in the past is because I did a show where I I based the title off of the New King James verse. And ironically, we were talking about wineskins, um, you know, which is actually where I got the analogy that I just used. Um, and, you know, people were confused because they were like, you know, I'm reading the King James and it doesn't say wineskins. It says bottles. Well, if you go here, right, um, BibleHub.com. So Bible yeah. Hub, you put in the verse, right? It automatically pops up every version known to man. So you can read that yep. verse. And two fifteen, and you can see the differences. So, you know yeah, I mean? like, you, yeah, you can see the massive differences. You know what I mean? So, and another thing about that I love about Bible Hub is you can look at the Strong's numbers. So not only that, but you can compare it to. The only thing I don't like is they don't have the Textus Receptus up there, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually the reason I bought my physical copy of the Textus Receptus. Because anytime you use Greek up there, especially if you're using interlinear, it's it's a critical text. But what's great about it is, is then you can compare it and see, okay, which one of these is actually a better translation? And people will love, like one of the errors that, um, that Manly P. Hall is talking about um, that a lot of people talk about these days, and I believe I brought this up on the last show too, is they'll see the verse in Leviticus where it says if you're, you know, if you're of a poorer family, instead of bringing like two calves, you can bring two turtles. And everybody's like, well, a turtle isn't a clean animal. That's an error. But if you look it up in the Webster's 1828 dictionary, turtles is shorthand for turtle doves. And that was something that was understood hmm. thanks to the Webster's dictionary. But what it is, is this language is archaic and obsolete these days. So you actually do have to do a little studying so you can show yourself approved. And the thing about it is, is it's not hard. It's just how how much do you want to trust in the works, or how much do you want to? Uh, how much of a gambling person are you when it comes to trusting the Bible that's in your hands? The King James is a tried and true Bible that has been tested and been around for years, mm -hmm. and tons of good godly men used it. I mean, you're talking. Um, uh, uh, John Bunyan. Um, you're talking Charles Spurgeon. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, and I believe Charles Spurgeon actually spoke out against the newer translations too. Like he didn't trust them. Um, Charles Spurgeon. I mean, you know, take your pick of a lot of these uh, Puritans, especially like the later Puritans, were using the King James Bible, and look at the wonderful things they did. Like, if it was good enough for them, why shouldn't it be good enough for us? Why do we need a new, you know, there's that old saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? But the King James Bible is not broken. 
And those of you who are telling you this is because they are believing a Masonic lie. And that's my challenge for everybody that, that will watch this now or watch it at any point in the future. <clears throat> you know, we're talking, do you really want to trust your, you know, everything you're relying on the Bible to something that could potentially be words that were spread around by Jesuits and Freemasons? Well, check this out, right? And um, I'm in uh, Spurgeon.org, right? So he talks about like, yeah, uh, King James loved the uh, King James. I'm sorry, uh, Charles Spurgeon loved the King James Bible, but he did use other ones, but, you know, occasionally. But he points out there too, for, uh, for Romans 8.1, right? So if you don't think there's a big deal, right? King James Bible says, there is now... Um, no condemnation to them that which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, the English Standard Version says, there is not, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. That's it. So they completely left out who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So you got to tell me that's a, not a big deal? That whole sentence is left yeah. out. Why is that left and, out? Because it tells you you and, need to walk not after the flesh, you need to walk after the spirit. And you wouldn't Absolutely. know that in the English uh, ESV. You wouldn't so, know that. Hey, it's not there. Hey, give me just a minute. Yep. Uh, I'm going to pull a live switcheroo again. Yeah. And so when you guys see me, I'll be in a different location, but I am coming back. I promise. All right. So, yeah. Give me just a few minutes. I'll be yeah, back go on for it. Thank Appreciate you it. Stuff here. Thank you, sir. Yep. So, yeah, guys. Um, <laughs> Really easy to understand here. So, that's why we're always on people's butts about the Bibles, and it is a big deal, very big deal. Again, if you left this out here, right, the highlighted text here, yeah, it's the same from here to here, but because it explains in details, you need to not, you don't need to walk after the flesh, but you need to walk after the spirit. You wouldn't know that in the English uh, Standard Version and NIV and everything else. So this is where Spurgeon points out. Uh, Charles Spurgeon pointed these things out back then. About the whole sentence and words missing. Why do you think these newer Bibles have thousands of words missing? But they'll, you know, the people defend it. Oh, they're in the footnotes. Why would you put them in the footnotes? Why can't you just leave it alone? How many people are going to go actually read the footnotes? I mean, it, it makes no sense at all. Not at all. You know, it's like, leave it alone. Just leave it the way it is. Why put it in the footnote? Why move it? You know what I mean? <laughs> Talk about confusion. That's confusion right there. And that's a big deal. You know what I mean? Uh, you need to walk after the spirit, not the flesh. You know, and then that, that and things, they, they take these things out, these small little things out, which are big things, because they, you know, in today's modern version of Christianity, man, it's diluted. Oh, you can do what you want. That's why, because of this stuff, that's why gays are being allowed to get married in the churches now. That's be, and all this stuff going on. And uh, yeah, in the churches, because of this stuff, because they don't know the Bible. You know, because they study the ESV, the NIV, because it's quote unquote easier to read, quote unquote, and they miss all the stuff. They miss that. Very important context. That's context right there. Gone. So there's a very big deal with the stuff. And uh, so I want to address some other rumors here, too. Um, you know, King James, right? One rumor said that King James was gay, right? So let me get the picture here. Yeah. There's a picture of supposedly him and his mother. And I think it was 1785 or three, whatever the case. But this was a, a picture that was surfaced around of King James and his mother painting. You know what I mean? Of course, the, the photograph didn't come out to the 1800s. But this was a, a photograph of painting, whatever the case, that was cert, you know, circulated. That he dressed like a drag queen, literally. You know, and, you know, picture of his mother. He he never he, he was, wasn't was with his mother he never reunited with his mother. So this is a complete fallacy altogether. David Carrico brought this up a few weeks ago on a midnight ride. You know what I mean? It, it, this picture's false. It's, it's false information. And it was the Jesuits who did this, guys. The Jesuits, they're the ones who created subversion. And if you don't know what subversion is, it's like, yeah. You know this uh, so-called QAnon movement going around? Yeah. These people, <laughs> they're not who they say they're. They're not patriots. These people, communists, these people, the Jesuits, the CIA, that's who they are. 
Now, every time a country or whatever is on the verge of revolution or a big movement's rising up against evil, what they'll do is they'll subvert it, okay, infiltrate it, act like and pose as the patriots. And yeah, they'll give some information like Q, right? They give information out that's true. But it's not stuff that we haven't been telling you for, you know, 10, 20 years already. They give the stuff out just to lure you in. They don't give out false predictions or, uh, you know, false things that, go, you know, we're going to do this at a certain date. We're shutting this one down. We're going to reinstall DT in the White House. Dates come and go. Nothing happens. And what it does is it purposely makes the whole so-called truth movement, whatever the case is, uh, opposition, right? It makes them look dumb. And, and it's easy for the public and uh, the mainstream media to criticize them, to demonize them, so the movement just loses its muster. That's the purpose of it. And uh, this whole QAnon thing, and then, you know, it's just one example. And they did the same thing the Jesuits did, that propaganda. They worked with the Nazis as well. Uh, yeah, the, Je the Jesuits are big funders and pushers of the Nazi movement. And uh, ministries of pop propaganda and all that, they, they were doing this stuff back then to demonize King Philip. Because I know in today's world, people say, oh, he's gay, oh, so what? You know what I mean? Back then, it wasn't like that. Yeah, actually, about 50 years ago, yeah, it, you, you were frowned upon, literally. Uh, you, and if you were in a school, you found out you're gay, they would kick your butt. You know what I mean? That's the way it was back then. Yeah, people don't know that today because everything's accepted today. All the perversion is all accepted, so nobody would know that. But it was a big deal, a very big deal uh, if you were caught being gay. Here in the United States as well. So they would do this, okay, to try to demonize him. And the fact that, that he didn't run with his mother like that, it's, just a, it's a fake picture that the Jesuits put together. It's called propaganda. Like the title, Jesuits, Lies of Propaganda, and they even attempted to assassinate uh, King James, which we brought up uh, last week about the gunpowder plot. So let me, uh, the, and that's a symbol there. And we could get to the symbolism of that. So... And if you remember, we brought this up uh, two weeks ago. I'm sorry, not last week. Uh, the gunpowder plot. It was um, this guy, uh, Father Henry Garnett, a Jesuit priest, right? He used this guy, uh, Guy Fox. That's where that mask comes from. Like uh, QAnon and all these people wearing this on uh, November 4th. You know, they're saying, uh, remember, remember. The 5th of, I think, of November, I think it is. But yeah, and they... And the thing is, the, truth, the Patriot movement, the truth is, they wear these masks all the time. And they act like this guy is somewhat of a hero or whatever the case. This guy's not. So he wasn't the Jesuit himself, this guy Fox. He was a um, mastermind. He worked for Henry Garnett, who was a Jesuit priest. The Jesuits, what they did was, uh, at the Parliament building, and uh, they, it was a big meeting coming up, the House of Parliament. That's where all the leaders of France go to. You know, King James is going there, all the leaders, the religious leaders, all in one building. So before that, Henry Garnett and this guy, Goy Fox, yeah, they planted on the first floor of the Parliament building, and they didn't use it. So they kept bringing tons of kegs, big kegs of gunpowder in it. Because what they wanted to do is when all the people met, all the leaders of France met, right, they wanted to blow the whole thing up. They wanted to destroy everybody, all these people, to dethrone France. Because the thing is, King James was a Protestant. King James pushed a Protestant doctrine. And then the Jesuits didn't like that. So why do you think later, the French Revolution, later on, with King um, uh, Louis the 16th, I think is, and Queen Man uh, Marie Antoinette, yeah, they put propaganda against them too to try to overthrow England. And that's what the whole uh, uh, French Revolution was about. It was the same people involved with that and it was the same people involved to try to uh, assassinate King James. And, if, you know, thank God this uh, failed. But it was, it was the Jesuits were behind us. It was in 1605. And that's what the whole movement was. And uh, Henry Garnett, he was a Jesuit priest, superior of England. He was finally caught up with a few months later on January 3rd of 1606 along with his fellow Jesuit priest, Edward uh, Oldcorn. These guys orchestrated this whole ordeal and used Guy Fox, And he was like a mercenary, Guy Fox, uh, Guy Fox, whatever. So Garnett and his fellow uh, Jesuit conspirator, Olcorn, were placed in adjoining rooms and able to communicate with one another. Eavesdropping were able to gain information in a way on several occasions. So when he, this is when they were in prison, right? So Garnett uh, has first denied all speech with Olcorn, but subsequently, on March 8th, he confessed his connection to the plot. And he was tried at the Goat Hall of uh, March 28th. 
and both were hung on May 3rd in 1606. Now, uh, Ghana entered the Novicate of Society of Jesus at, well, that's the Jesuits, at St. Andrew in and Rome in September 11th of 1575. So, we could go on forever with the stuff, but um, why people going around where these masks were, because the Jesuit cover-up, and if you go to the Jesuits' websites, they'll try to say they were the victims. Yeah, and you could actually go to the Jesuits' website on the, the gunpowder plot. They defend themselves. So they go, oh, we were the victims because we were being persecuted in uh, England, uh, France. I'm sorry. We were being persecuted because King uh, James, he outlawed, like, I don't want Jesuit crap in my country. He came, and there was a damn good reason he did that for. He said, I don't want these Jesuits in my country because exactly what they were doing now, and he knew all the stuff was going on, all the sinister details by the Jesuits, and he outlawed Jesuits in this country. So they claim religious persecution, but these people are very evil. So they attempt to uh, assassinate King James after this. And because, again, King James had a very good reason to ban these people from the country. Yeah, you know I mean, it's, it's crazy, right? And, uh, you know, you can see the history of what these people did. And if you missed that show two weeks ago, uh, go watch it. And uh, we run down a lot of stuff that the Jesuits did. And so the Vatican arch critic of Edwin Sherman called the Jesuits the engineer cause of hell. That they were the corpse of hell. Like the Marine Corps, but these guys were, yeah. And his prophetical title book where he pre-published uh, front cover can be seen assassination attempt on Abraham Lincoln paraded in plain view. It was purported that the Catholic priest and friend of Lincoln, Charles Trickley, that the Jesuits were responsible for his murder and Trickley sets out the chronicles of his book. 50 years in Roman uh, Church of Rome. And he notes that Lincoln's own words it is not against the Americans of South alone. I am fighting. It is more against the Pope of Rome. His perditious Jesuits and the bl uh, blind and bloody thirsty slaves will have to be defeated, uh, defend ourselves. So this is Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States of America, later on warned about the Jesuits. And it's more. Uh, John Quincy Adams, he has before him, did the same thing. But this is the, the sinisters of the Jesuits, guys. And uh, they, that's why all the propaganda against King James, they did that. The Jesuits did that. They had the hand in the French Revolution, and they tried to restart the American Revolution. And when I say the Jesuits, guys, I'm talking about also the Order of the Illuminati. It's the same thing. They're the ones who created the Illuminati. It was Ignatius of Loyola who created the Order of the Illuminati, kept it hidden within the Jesuit order. And right in the Vatican. So for hundreds of years while this is going on, people started connecting. Oh, there's a connection with the Illuminati in Rome. So they had Adam Weissop. He was a professor in canon law from English State University. He was also a Jesuit priest, lived in Bavaria, Germany. So what he did to get the spotlight off of Rome, he officially created, founded the Order of the Illuminati out of Bavaria, Germany in 1776, May 1st. So that got the spotlight off of Rome because they were getting a lot of heat from that. So, and again, um, <laughs> it was concealed within the Jesuit order because when um, Ignatius Loyola came up with the idea of the Order of the Illuminati, it was too revealing. So the Pope told him to dis disguise that. So he came up with the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus. I mean, who's going to say, oh, these people are evil? We're a society of crazy, man. And um, so Trey's back in a minute. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, so this is, uh, they're the ones behind the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And it gets more. Uh, the secret history of Jesuits documents how society Jesus influenced and aided and even funded the Nazi party. The SS organization had been constituted according to the principles of the Jesuit order. Hitler referred to his general Heimlich Himmler as the Ignatius of Loyola and obtained the Nazi swastika of Catholic Abbey from the priest called uh, Father Hagan. Irish firebrand preacher and neo-Protestant agent provocateur Ian Paisley is described in the press of the Jesuits who were said, uh, quote-unquote, they are the Gestapo of the Roman Catholic Church who carry out the orders of the Pope throughout the world. Dr. P you know, unquote, Dr. Paisley defends his position by quoting Emmons' Paris book on arguing, I am given the quotation from the Reform, which is the uh, press of Spanish dictator Franco published on May 3rd of 1945, the day Hitler's death. Yeah, I mean, it just goes on here. And Paley continues that Adolf Hitler's son of the Catholic Church died while defending Christianity. It is therefore understandable that the words cannot be found in the lament over the death when so many people uh, can be found will exult in his life. 
For many, his mortal remain stands a victorious memorial. Um, I'm sorry, not at all. He was an occultist, and uh, the Catholic Church loved Hitler. And um, again, uh, we have to say this all the time. People today don't understand, okay, because all these denominations get lumped into the thing called Christianity. So there's a big difference between uh, Constantine's version of Christianity and, you know, uh, the followers of Jesus Christ. And uh, there's a biblical Christian, I'm, I'm sorry, there's biblical Jesus and there's Catholic Jesus. Two different things. You know what I mean? So people need to understand that. So, yeah, and so in the 19th century preacher uh, of righteousness, Charles Spurgeon had warned the new breed of preacher would be a sort changed by the so-called hollowed institutions of learning because they had uh, kept back a portion of the gospel, having studied in the devil's new Jesuitical colleges, colleges run by the Jesuits. Uh, for Spurgeon, the mark of Cain is a constant reminder to popery there that a figurative and vagabond you shall be on the earth. Genesis 4.12 was murder, pedophilia, and every other known imaginable evil has been done to those who are your brothers. In the name of the false god, just as Cain uh, cared for himself, and what does the evil church for the no repentance and its part for what has done in the long savage history even today. Talk about the... Um, uh, the Jesuits there. So you got Pope Clement. Uh, now, uh, you know, this Pope actually was awake because uh, the Jesuits served the Pope. This Pope here, he was actually murdered a year later by uh, food poisoning when he made the statement. For, uh, pope Clement XIV said, and while signing the bull, uh, he remarked, I am signing my death warrant. In other words, he signed this, um, it was a perpetual decree to suppress the Jesuit orders in 1773, I think it is. So his um, decree was to suppress um, the Jesuit order because he found out what they were doing. And I guess this guy was actually a good pope. And so he said that I'm signing my death warrant by signing this decree. And sure enough, he died a year later from food poisoning. You know what I mean? And a couple more quotes and we'll get back to Trey. Um, this is uh, John Quincy Adams here from President of the United States. He says, my history of the Jesuits is not eloquently written but is supported by unicable authorities. It is very particular and very horrible. Their restoration is indeed a step towards darkness. Cruelty, purity, despotism, death, and I wish we were out of danger of bigotry and Je uh, Jesuitism. And he also says, I do not like the late resurrection of the Jesuits. If I ever, any congregation of men could merit etern yeah, excuse me, eternal perdition on earth, and it is hell, in hell. According to these historians, though the Paschal true Catholics, it is the company of the Loyolas, which is the Jesuit order. And uh, so, yeah, the confessions of the... Pro yeah, this is just goes on with stuff uh, crazy, man. Confession of the Jesuits made Protestants say upon force to convert to Catholicism. And this is part of their oath. Uh, basically, when um, the Jesuits were at the time, they were burning Christians, you know, Protestants, whatever, for having Bibles. So they would give them a chance to convert back to Catholicism. Yeah, again, showing a big difference between Catholicism and real Christianity. You know what I mean? So they would tell him to confess uh, that whatever n new thing the Pope of Rome may have instituted, whether it be scriptural or not, it's, it's true, divine, and full of salvation. So no matter what the Pope says, even if it's against doctrine or saying, it's, yeah, it's, it's divine, you need to listen to it. And therefore, ought to be regarded as a higher value by lay of people. And then even the precepts of the living God. So they're saying this was a, the oath that the people had to swear to save their lives. And we confess that the Pope has power of altering Scripture or increasing or diminishing its according to his will. So the Pope gets to do whatever he wants. And, you know, he can override the Bible. That's what they're saying, right? And we confess that the most holy pontiff ought to be honored by all with divine honor and with more restoration than even what is due to Christ himself. So this is what the Jesuits had. Um, these people, you know, the, the Protestants, that you need to convert back because we're going to kill you. Okay, you got a Bible, we're going to kill you, kids, but you can come back to Catholicism and you need to say recite this oath and in literally saying that the Pope has more power and more, more merit than Jesus Christ himself. And he has the power to change scripture. This is the, and the, the, the um, Jesuit order is the strong arm of the Catholic Church. It really is. And I guess some more stuff here. If, um, I don't know if you want to uh, jump in on that, Trey. Or you want me to finish my slides here? Yeah. No, by all means, keep going. You're on a roll. All right. 
so uh, if you go to Revelation 17, right, 5 and 6, it talks about upon her head, her referring to a woman, which is uh, in the Bible, the woman's called, the, it's, the, it's the church. It's not an actual woman. So upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great and the Mother of Harlots and the Abominations of the Earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So now put this into perspective, right? The Catholic Church, right, they were killing people for possessing the word of God. You believe that? Hundreds of years, they, they said it was over a million, about a million families in the whole that they killed for possessing the Bible and uh, going to Protestantism, right, to become the president instead of going, obeying the Catholic Church. The blood of the saints and these Knights Templars and all that, and the Jesuits, when they were around killing people, guys, they, they had no mercy. They took babies, bashed their skulls on the ground, uh, just like the, the merciless stuff that these people did. And that's not the blood of the saints right there. And if you go to, this is a Dewey Rhymes Bible. This is what the Jesuits use. And look at the symbol on there. Yeah. It's, so, uh, but the blood of the uh, Protestants is not called the blood of saints. So this is the Jesuits themselves. They're saying, no, no. The blood of the Protestants is not, they're not saints. And no more than blood of thieves, man killers, and other male factors. So they're just disgracing them. For those shedding of which, by the order of justice, no commonwealth shall answer. So I think I had some other slides, but um, I don't know what happened to those. But yeah, this just shows you that the Jesuits, oh yeah, I got the, hang on a second. And then this is, a, well, they call it the Jesuit Oath. And I'm not going to read it all because it's long. But I'm going to get to the point here. This is called, you can actually go look at this. Um, this is uh, right on the government's website. The government of Australia and a lot of governments talk about this. And this is what John Quincy Adams warned us about. Um, yeah, literally by killing Killing Protestants. They say Catholic Universal Church. Let me see if I can um, find that real quick. All right, here it is. This is a relentless war. So they want to wage war on Protestants against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals. And I'm directed to uh, expirate from the face of the earth. Um, yeah, we're directed to this is the oath that a Jesuit has to take. Their goal is to um, wipe every Protestant, which we call Christians today, off the face of the earth. And that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition. And that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive those infamous heretics who rip up their stomachs and wombs out of the woman. So they're saying they'll rip the babies out of the woman and crush the infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate the inexorable race. So it goes on. You can read it for yourselves, guys, and I'll put the link in the chat room here. Uh, so this is an oath, and it's a long oath, but it is horrible, okay? Uh, horribly disgusting. This is a Jesuit order, and this is on the Jesuits' website, too. That's the oath they take to become a Jesuit. These people are very evil. And then when you drive by the, oh, you know, there's uh, Jesuit churches out there. I'm not saying the people go to the churches are evil and they do this stuff. I'm talking about the people who work with, like, the priests and all that. This is the oath that they take. Just keep that in mind. This is a very sinister and evil organization altogether. That is still around to this very day. Yeah, it's just, like, really crazy. So um, this is some of the stuff the Jesuits did. And we can go over that. Um, then I'll let uh, Trey uh, jump in here. So they, you know, when we heard about the the Reformation, you know, with Charles Tyndale's and Martin Luther and all that, so the Jesuits created the Counter Reformation. That again would slaughter so many innocent people. And like, uh, yeah, and uh, to exalt the Pope to you know, like he's equal to God. These guys served the Pope, and they were the Gestapo of the Roman Catholic Church, plain and simple. And there's a lot of stuff they did, and um, there's like, just so much material here. And uh, the ratification of the Edict of Nantes, and we can get into the stuff here. The, well, the 16th century massacre of the Waldenians. The, well, now, the Waldenians was a group of people who were Protestants. They preached the Bible, and they, they taught themselves the Bible. You know, and of course, the Knights Temple didn't like that. So there was a massacre of the Waldenians in Merle. And as the Refor Reformation developed in France, in the first half of the 16th century, 
There were several episodes of severe repression of the preceded by the wars of religion, which uh, 1562 to 1598. Um, these were times of great hardship and oppression against those who embraced the Protestant teachings. And one of notable uh, persecution took place in the uh, Liberican region of France against the Waldenians and a spiritual descendants of Pierre Waldo, which led to the Marl de Massacre in 1545. So long story short, it was, um, yeah, the Jesuits went in there and slaughtered these people. And it goes on, man, it really does. And there's more of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where the widespread of slaughter of French Protestants, killing French Protestants by Catholic, the Catholics, beginning on the 24th of August in 1572, and lasted for over two months, resulting in the deaths of between three to 25,000 people. Imagine that. They saw it when they saw about 25,000 people because they didn't appear to the Catholic rule. And they had their own Bibles and they, you know, all that good stuff, right? It began in Paris and when the Catholic uh, faction, fear monk, uh, fearing and uh, hug about uprising, assassination, and leading to the Protestants that were here for a royal wedding. So it goes on with the details. I'm just showing you the uh, bullet points here because it could be all night. Then you got the Babylon, uh, Babington plot, right? The Babington plot was uh, a plan in 1586 to assassinate Queen Elizabeth I, a Protestant, and Mary Queen of Scots, a Catholic cousin on the English throne, and it led to Mary's execution as a result of a letter sent by Mary, who was in prison 19 years since uh, 1568 in England, and uh, so, which uh, consented in the assassination of Elizabeth. So, caused by the Jesuits, right? And there's, there's more. In the Council of Trent, right? The Ro in Roman Catholicism, you heard some people learn about this in school. The Council of Trent was a, a 19th, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, 19th century ecumenical, con no, it's not, all right. It's Council of Trent, says 19th ecumenical council, okay? It was a 19th ecumenical council of the Roman Catholic Church held in three parts, from uh, 1545 to 1563, prompted by the Reformation, the Council of Trent responded emphatically against the issues here at hand and enacted a formal Roman Catholic reply to the doctrinal changes of Protestants. Because of Protestants, uh, that's what caused this, uh, this whole uh, Council of Trent. It thus represents the official adjudication of many questions about which uh, there had been continuing ambiguity throughout the early church in the Middle Ages. The council was highly important for its sweep decrees on self-reform and its uh, dogmatic definitions that clarified virtually every doctrine contested by the Protestants. So this was a reformation basically to um, counter, I'm sorry, a counter-reformation that played a vital key role in revitalizing the Roman Catholic Church in many parts of Europe. So basically to like engage on the Protestants. That's what the whole thing was about. And there was so much more. And uh, this here is uh, on October 18, 1685, the Edict of Nantes. So this, this is um, the, uh, uh, Louis, the King Louis the Fourteenth revokes the Edict of Nantes in French uh, Hugues to uh, flee uh, in South Carolina. So he revoked this Edict and uh, to uh, so Hugues could ne uh, either convert to Catholicism. So this was um, a pope. I'm sorry, uh, a king put in by the Jesuits in France, and he put an edict that you would uh, you had to convert to Catholicism. This was to the people, right? So the the king was who was a Jesuit, right? right? He put an edict on October 18th of 1685, and the edict of Nantes was revoked in French. Uh, Huguenots, uh, I think I pronounced it right, could either convert to Catholicism or face a life in prison or convert or flee the country. So this was the ultimate that you get, were given. If you didn't convert to Catholicism, yeah, you'd be put to death or you could face life in prison or pay heavy fines, whatever the case. And at this time, there were about 800,000 Huguenots in France and nearly one-fourth of them left the country. They talk about persecution, that's persecution right there. You either convert back to Catholicism and that's it. You know what I mean? And there's more. You got St. Ignatius Loyola and St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, you know, they call God defeating evil. So you see this picture here, right? And this, uh, the statue that's in St. Peter's Basilica. This is uh, Ignatius Loyola, they call a saint. 
He's not a saint at all. You know, this guy was very evil. So if you see him, he's standing on somebody's head. And this person's got a book in their hand, right? And David Carrico pointed this out. Now, that they're, they're trying to say this is like basically he's standing on Satan or something like that, right? But if you notice the book in his hand, okay, and we believe that's not Satan. And we believe that's the Protestants because Ignatius Loyola was against the Protestants, right? And that he's the, order, uh, he's the founder of all the Jesuits and all, also the other Illuminati, right? So if you look at that, he's standing on the, the head of a, a Protestant holding the Bible. Even though there's no title on that book, they did that purposely. That goes to show you what that whole thing was all about. You know what I mean? And there's more little things here. And, uh, now, John Adams, right? John Adams to, wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson, June 26th, 2nd of 1815, right? So this whole letter is warning about the Jesuits. You can go read it for yourself. This is actually in the National Archives, archives.gov. Warning about the Jesuits. And John Adams and John Quincy Adams, which is his son, both of them, like, they came firing out against Freemasonry and the Jesuits and everything else because these guys knew what was going on. And plus, you, you know, the Jesuits and Freemasonry are the same, same pool. You know what I mean? It's disgusting. It really is. So, uh, I mean, that, I'm done with my slides and everything else here, but uh, there's so much more. I mean, I could uh, really take all the night to literally read all that, but there's some resources. If you want to screenshot those, go read them for yourselves. Get more details about it, and there's more stuff that adds on to it. But you'll see the nasty um, stuff that the Jesuits still do to this very day. And from, from 1500s, I forgot what year exactly, from the 1500s to here in 2024, the Jesuits, although they got the hands in every sinister thing. Where do you think the CIA comes from? Them. All these, all the sinister things going on in this world is from them, guys. They're the, the heartbeat of the whole thing. So, what's up, Trey? <laughs> Not much, man. That was great. That was yeah, awesome. Man. A lot of stuff, man. And I was like digging this up all, all week, and uh, there's like there's just so much more, and uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, all these plots and assassinations and uh, all that stuff. And that we know Abraham Lincoln too is something to do with the Federal Reserve, which they're behind it too. You know, and them and uh, the Zionists they go hand in hand. The Jesuits is a Zionist organization. It's uh, it, it's going, it's just say it's so crazy, man. When you go down these rabbit holes, guys, and you get all these connections yeah. together and you learn that all these societies are actually off the same root of evil. You know what I mean? It is so insane. I think we lost Trey. You still there, brother? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, oh. Uh, but apparently I've been over here talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you are. No, I mean, I was just, uh, yeah, I was just saying, uh, you know, you, you can't make this stuff up. You really can't, you know, this is one of those, you know, truth is stranger than fiction stories, right? So, um, so I mean, yeah, uh, excellent, excellent presentation. The parts I caught of it were awesome. Yeah, thanks, brother, and uh, and I hope we cleared up a lot of stuff about King James. We got our questions and answers sure. coming up in a little bit here, and uh, I put sure. it for I posted for eleven, but sometimes we run over eleven, so I'm not yeah rushing anybody, but uh, um. I do have just a few more things I'd like oh, to yeah, cover absolutely. before we go to that, but it's not a lot. It's just the scriptures. Like, So basically, here's the thing. Here's what I want to let everybody know. One of the biggest problems that one of the biggest complaints I see about King James right now is the fact that, uh, well, King James just ruth uh, ruthlessly killed all of these people that were confused uh, or accused of witchcraft, or some of them weren't even accused of witchcraft. They were just... They were just, they had consulted witches and he put them to death. I want to show you something. Exodus twenty two eighteen. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Uh, Leviticus 20, 27. A man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones and their blood shall be upon them. You know, anybody who is a a a a god appointed judge and king james believed that he was and 
He believed that he was God's hand of judgment on this earth, which, by the way, that's what Romans 13 says. It says that they are there for the sword to punish evildoers. That is what the the uh, you know, that is what the the governors of this world are there for. Um, so, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you love them or you hate them. God has seen fit to put them there. Um, and I, you know, I'd much rather have somebody who's going to carry out biblical justice than somebody who's going to put someone in jail because they used the wrong pronouns on somebody. Right. So mm -hmm. that was Leviticus. Uh, that was Leviticus 20, 27. This is by no means an exhaustive list. I just picked out the ones that are outright condemning of uh, anything to do with the occult or witchcraft. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord because these abominations the Lord thy God doth for and because of these uh, abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee talking about you know the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Hittites and you know all the ites uh, and then finally I, I love this one because this one actually comes from the New Testament for you know you know, I mean, you got to make sure to throw the New Testament in there for the people that forget about the first part of the book, right? Uh, Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, we just talked about how these things were abominations, and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's not just about being you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, put to death in this life. You know, that's why the Bible says, you know, there's other verses that say, you know, you shouldn't even have anything to do with these people to be defiled by them. You know, uh, the, the, you know, this, this stuff is, it's, it's poisonous. It poisons the people that go to see them, which is why King James had them put to death. Um, you know, that was that was to make an example of them, to make people fearful to even go see witches. Mm. And uh, because you shouldn't. I mean, these this will ruin your life. You shouldn't go consult mediums. You shouldn't. Because here's the thing about it. Some of these people have genuine abilities that cannot be explained in the rational world. But a lot of them are charlatans. Mm. They're conning you. They're scam artists. Number one. You should not be trusting these people to read your palm or tell you your fortune or tell you what your zodiac sign is. It's a waste of time. But even then, these are people, and I was talking about this with David Carrico once. We got to talking about this. Um, and, you know, I told him, I was like, I was like, when I look at, you know, witchcraft, it seems like the people who tap into God's power without his permission. Mm -hmm. and, and and that's what it is. And, you know, in one of the slides that I got, I put that verse up there from uh, Enoch 7-1 because it talks about the angels picking wives from among the daughters of men. And what does it say they do in return to them? And there's a reason that I put this verse up there, by the way. You know, it talks about they taught them, you know, the cutting of roots and enchantments and all of these things. And that's exactly what the witches in the days of the North Barrack witch trials and the Salem witch trials, these women were accused of copulation with the devil. And, and in, in return, they were given magical powers. Well, isn't, it, isn't that amazing? That the, and, and everybody that you – if you watch any documentaries or anything on this, they're like, well, obviously this was fantasy, but why would they believe that? And they're like, oh, well – well, this is just the opposite of what a good housewife would do. A good housewife, she tends to the house and, you know, she uses her broom to sweep the floors and witches use them to ride all over the place. And instead of going home and being a loving wife to her husband, she's out there sleeping with the devil. Um, like they just made this stuff up because it's the opposite of what a good housewife would do. Um, and then that's ridiculous because it comes from these ancient texts that they were doing this. Mm. So why wouldn't they be doing that in those days? 
and and that was some of the things I wanted to to talk about. And I had, you know, I had, you know, there's it's not just back then, you know, these people were accused of killing children and things like that. And if you read the writings of Aleister Crowley, Aleister Crowley talked about how the ideal sacrifice was a male child. You know, um, I mean, Aleister Crowley was all about human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. He was all about, you know, he talks about with my hawk's head, I poke, I uh, peck out the eyes of Jesus as he hangs upon the cross. Like this dude was into some evil stuff. And, you know, where did he get it from? And you know, I was going to read all those quotes, but, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to keep everybody longer than I have to. Cause the reality is, is if you just buy, if you go to, uh, FOJC, radio.com you can go to their uh their resources page and all of their books are up there and i highly encourage you if you can stomach it to get the egyptian satanic uh, the egyptian masonic satanic connection uh because it's full of what these dark black magicians actually do it's full of the sex magic rituals that they they i mean it's vile stuff but it's important stuff for people to know because this stuff is not pretend it's not fantasy Th these things actually happen and and until we're willing to talk about it it's never going to be exposed so i highly recommend you if you can read that book you totally should it, that that actually hurt my ears yeah and i got the link in the description too guys so fojcradio.com and uh, yeah, it's got, this page is awesome. It's uh, it's it's not fancy at all, and doesn't need to be. But there's so much information in this page. Uh, you can pull up stuff for free, you know, like uh, free uh, tracks and everything else. But there's a list of their books yeah. here, and um, all kinds of stuff there. And I'm uh, you know, happy to be working with FOJC Radio. Uh, that's why I show yeah. here. You'll see this on FOJC Radio. Uh, coming Thursday, so uh, our show is now broadcast on there as well. We're thankful for that. It's broadcasted also on ShakeAwakeRadio.com, yeah. and it's amazing. We're just getting out there, you know. What I mean, and it's a group of us people. Yeah, you know, a bunch of us. Like you got Trey with Cross Correction Radio, me with um, Truth Radio Show. You got uh, Brian with the Visual Disturbance, FOJC Radio. You got um, the Midnight Riot, and uh, you know, and now you see TV and all that. So all these people put together to bring uh we we run our like separate shows but it's one entity you know what i mean one entity under jesus christ and we all work together sure. that's why you always see one of these guys on my show for because uh we're trying to stick with the group now now what um actually speaking of that so when i was saying a few weeks ago we're going to move to a new formation basically in the show and uh brian uh wasn't part of that new formation like the you know it's saying we didn't kick brian out brian uh, as he explained he um took a job with fojc radio because he's very valuable especially the stuff he does so yeah you know he had a lot of workload on his plate so he went over there and like you always welcome back here yeah, it's fine but we still work together i talk to him all the time so basically sure. we're all doing shows together so now this new format yeah. i'm doing here that's why we're not gonna uh we're not gonna bring other people on the show no more that's um that doesn't match our line of scripture. That's what I'm saying because we brought people yeah. on the show, good people, and I love them. I mean, I'm not saying nothing bad about them, but they they quote scripture with apostate Bibles. They bring up unbiblical stuff as a, as its doctrine, and we don't want to run into that because I I mean a lot of you guys that watch the show here, you guys are very smart. So and I notice you guys picking them yeah. apart left and right. You know what I mean? Where a certain person talk about this, he's bringing up um, another version of the Bible that's apostate. You guys are picking it right out, and you know, thank you for doing that. So we decided to move to a format that we can't allow that stuff to be on the show. You know what I mean? If somebody's uh, coming on here, we bring somebody on the show, and they're promoting that book, and you guys go out and buy that book, then you know, for I'm not mentioning the person's name, he writes great books, but he, he exalts the um, the Quran. As if it's a doctrine of God. You know what I mean? So if I promote him, right, you guys go out and buy his book. And you're reading stuff from the Quran that, uh, you know, he's saying it's true. What's that going to do to you? It's going to disrupt your faith. Because the Quran is so nothing good about the Quran at all. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and by the way, this, uh, you know, there's, uh, I believe the same person never mentions the Jesuits either. Yeah. Yep. Which is suspicious. Yeah, because it was um, two two weeks ago when we did the studies on the first Jesuit show. I was like, yeah, he's got to have some something to say about the Jesuits. Everything else but the Jesuits. That's, that was very weird. <laughs> yeah, and, and maybe it's just a coincidence. Yeah. But, you know, because I, I totally, for me personally, uh, I've had to learn that it is a lot easier to follow. Uh, it makes life a lot easier to 
to adhere to the verse in First Corinthians 13 where it says charity hopes all things. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want you want to try to see the best. Even people you like, you don't want to assume the worst of, of people. That's a very unhealthy way to live. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you also have to be realistic and understand that, you know, you you can't. You you've got to be willing to call things the the way they are. Like you know, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, odds are it's probably a duck. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, and I, I look, I respect that decision because. That's that's ultimately what it does, you know. When you, you know, it's great to to have dialogues with people and you know see the areas where you know what what, what divides you and whatnot, right? Like you know, you may believe one thing, this person believes one thing. Unfortunately, it it, it can also be a way that can sow confusion, especially with new believers. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's already so hard because you know uh, your channel, my channel. We have a tendency to, you know, have people that have, you know, experienced like any type of church hurt or they notice the church, you know, they don't do this or this, but they, they do this. And the Bible clearly, you know, doesn't agree with that. So there's already so many questions there anyway. And and, and it's just that's that's a big burden to take yeah, on. Man. So, I mean, I totally respect your decision there. I'm 100 percent behind you. Uh you know, it's just it's easier to keep things in the family, yeah. if you will, because we already we're already all open with each other. Yeah. And we're not willing. We're not afraid to ask each other questions and be like, you know, I'm you know, I, I need help with this particular issue. Like, you know, it's been it, it's been wonderful. It really has. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that's why when I do that, because like uh, and then the people I mentioned, I'm not mentioning names and uh they're very wonderful people, and uh, they they're great people, and I love them to death. But I I can't bring it upon myself to. Um, there was some people like David Carico and um, uh, uh, Brian who opened my eyes to this stuff because I was just bringing on anybody that wanted to talk, whatever. And I, I can't do that because they had a point. You know, it's like why bring some because you gotta direct them to a book that's gonna mislead them to a Quran or something like that. And I shouldn't be doing that. And uh, as a person who's you know preaches the Bible, it's my responsibility. So if I was responsible for you guys going to read somebody's book that led you to the Quran, that's on me. You know what I mean? I don't want nothing to do with that. You know what I mean? I don't want I don't want to have to answer the Father because the thing is the leaders pay the heavier price more. And I'm not saying I'm a leader, but the people who teach you, okay, if they mislead you, they pay a heavier price than you do. You know what I mean? That's the thing. Mm -hmm. So guys, uh, also uh, before we get going to the next show. Put the link in the chat room too. So, if guys, if you want to make a donation to this ministry here, uh, the link's in the chat room. It says if you wish to make a uh, donation, um, and it's also in the description too. We got four different ways. We got the uh, Ko-Fi site, we got a PayPal, Venmo, and a Cash app. So, just want to let you know where your money goes. Uh, uh, those links are trusted. Trust me, we had them for like uh, two, three years now, and um, the money goes into here. That get, buys us the equipment, gets the streaming service on Rumble, pays for the studio here, and um, I'm in the office building doing this stuff, so I have to pay rent, you know what I mean, and I have to work a full-time job to support my family, and this equipment here, and this camera I'm talking to you on is kind of new too, uh, all this stuff costs big money, you know what I mean, and uh, thanks to you guys' contributions, that's where the money goes. I'm very transparent where the money goes, it pays the bills and everything else for the the missionary, you know, the, the mission, um, the, the ministry, whatever you want to call it. And uh, that's what it pays for. So if you want to make a contribution, I don't care if it's even a dollar. It's a dollar more that I can use for this ministry. So if you want to make a contribution, please go into the links there. And uh, that Ko-Fi site, you don't have to sign up for nothing. Just donate what you want and um, you use whatever kind of credit card or bank card, whatever you want. But other than that, um, if you don't have the money, don't worry about it. Um, the Lord will provide either way. But uh, we always welcome your prayers. That's number one. Welcome your prayers uh, to protect this ministry and this organization and everything else because uh, we're just trying to get better. You know, we're trying to come out with better uh, shows. We want to make documentaries and all that. And unfortunately, a lot of it costs money. So, and right now, it's like um, when my situation at home is like we're just barely floating by. So, you know, if I take any money out there and put it to here, then I'm going to hear it from the wife, you know. So, uh, that it's one of those situations. But anyway, we're going to go to uh, the other side here. Uh, I'm going to put the link in the chat room one more time. So this is um, a Rumble channel, which we're going to be doing phone calls, questions and answers. This way, you're free to talk about what you want. So that's the channel there, guys. So what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, go out of here, guys, and we'll meet you over there in about five minutes. So 
about five minutes, head over to Rumble, go get a drink, go to the bathroom, all that good stuff. And yeah, let's go for free for all. You know, so if you want to call in, if you want to rebuke us, do it. If you want to call us, say we stink, do it. If you want to call us, say you guys are great, you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, make a comment, uh, testimony, whatever you want to do. So uh, for me and Trey, so uh, yeah, we'll see you in a few minutes. So God bless, Shalom, and you are the resistance.